Good morning, everyone from the Newport News Church of Christ. We're certainly glad that you have decided to join in with us to our members who be, might be watching virtually as well as those who are here present. We're so thankful for your presence and all. And uh, we've been studying out of the book of Malachi. And so we're going to continue our study. Uh, it's been a very enlightening study, uh, very practical lessons that we could use to help us in serving our God. I'm thankful to God that we were able to get up this morning. For those of you, we'll keep in mind those of our number who are still sick. Let's pray for them. Uh, we're going to be in Malachi chapter 3, if you're tuning in. Malachi chapter 3. And we're going to be around verses 3 through 6. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to finish up from where I left off last Sunday. And we're going to look at that for a moment. And then if I can get into the next part of the lesson, uh, maybe we'll, if we have time remaining, we'll kind of introduce that, Lord willing, for next week. All right. Malachi chapter 3 be with us. And so the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about you know, they speaking against God's righteousness. If you remember, uh, because of the na neighboring nations were prospering around them and, and they were wicked. And so remember in Malachi 2, 17, the Bible says, you have wearied the Lord, the messenger tells his people with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? And when you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of justice. So now we went and looked at this a little bit more as we got into chapter three and God made the promise that one day he's going to manifest his justice. Not that he hasn't already manifested it, but in the purest form, he's going to manifest his judgment. And we remember we said that there was one coming who was going to prepare the way of the Lord. His name was John the Baptist. Remember him? And then we talked about the one that he was the forerunner to, and that was Christ Jesus, who is the messenger of the covenant. Now, when God comes on the scene, of course, we're talking about 400 some years later now, from the time of Malachi's day. When Jesus finally comes on the scene, we see here that Malachi here writes these words, Malachi chapter three. Let's just look at this for a minute and read it. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Remember now, the messenger of the covenant would be Christ. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? In other words, who will be able to withstand his justice when he does come? He says, for he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the swearers, against those that oppose, oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. God is going to vindicate himself. God is going to manifest who he is before the people. These people of old should have known some of these things. But unfortunately, as in all cases, you know, sin appears to cascade itself and, and people seem to get further stooped in their ungodliness. And so it, and they allow their judgment to be impaired concerning who God is. Now, one thing in this matter, as they accuse God of not being just, is that God is not mocked. God is not mocked at all. Galatians, matter of fact, in uh, Malachi 3, 5, we see where 
God is going to deal with the people. Some people think that they can just get away with sin, don't they? Oh, yes, they do. Some people think they can get away. You know what? There are members in the church that think they can get away with sin. After you've heard lessons on how God feels about sin and how that God's eyes in every place behold good and evil. You see, if we're not careful, we, be, we can become dull in our hearing when the gospel is preached. And it appears that these people had become dull. In other words, they had gotten to the point where they were lukewarm. They, they didn't as care as much for God and his law as they should have been. And we saw that in the earlier study, right? Uh, in their offering, uh, the way they were dealing treacherously. Remember that word treacherously was mentioned quite a few times, dealing with one another and, and then committing adultery, uh, marrying those outside of the race. They were, in other words, they were not doing as God had commanded them. and then offering defected or defiled uh, offerings to the Lord, dishonoring him, not reverencing him like he should be. God is not just somebody around the street. God is the God almighty, the creator, and God is going to be reverenced. You know, one day, if you fail to reverence God now, when you leave this world in that last day, when every knee shall bow, whether you want to reverence him or not, you will reverence God on that day. And you don't want to wait till that day to reverence God. And you are going to confess who he is. Yes, you are. You may not do it now, but you will in the end. So, brethren, we need to be offering up praise to God now while we have the time to do so. You see, God is not fooled in this matter. You see, some people think that they can just get away. You see, no one's sins can be concealed from the omniscient God. What do I mean by that? Anybody know? What do I mean by that when I say no one's sins can be concealed from the omniscient God? You ever heard that word omniscient? Anybody ever studied the Bible? What do you think that word means? Omniscient. There you go. It means, for those of you who may be viewing, who may not know, it means all-knowing. Are we omniscient? No. There's a lot of things we don't know. And so, that's correct. And so, God is omniscient. You remember what Paul said to the church at Rome? Remember what Paul said there in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2? We've, we've heard this before, but I'll, I'll just reiterate it just for a moment. That just because you're a Christian and you've obeyed the gospel now, we must constantly be aware. We must constantly do our due diligence to be faithful to God, shouldn't we? So in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Paul says, what shall we say then? I'm in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, for those who are viewing. He says, shall we continue in sin? So you see, when you come to God, come to Christ and obey the gospel, there is something expected of us. Yes, there should be a change in your behavior. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Watch this, that grace may abound. You see, that's a rhetorical question, isn't it? No, the, what, what that is challenging is we do not continue in sin. Does that mean we're not going to ever sin again? That's not what that's saying. It should not be a habitual practice in your life, my brethren. Once we give our life to the Lord, God expects something of us. So the Bible says, God forbid, you see it? How shall we that are dead to sin? See, somewhere in there, we got to become dead to the practice of sin, shouldn't we? And live there any longer. God is not mocked in this matter, brother. You see, we have to make it up in our mind and have to decide, are we going to be right with God or not? Evidently, these people in Malachi's day, they had decided that they're going to do what they want to do. You know, we can do that too. You know, you can decide not to serve the Lord. 
You know, there's many. I've, I've obeyed the gospel since 1987. I've seen a lot of people in here, and I've seen a lot of people go away. And they have decided amongst themselves they're not going to serve anymore. That's right. They've decided that. And that's unfortunate. I was telling somebody not too long ago, if every person that has ever obeyed the gospel was to come back, we wouldn't have enough room here. We would probably need another building to fill it for the seats. We don't just have enough. Now, that's, that's unfortunate. But that's not the first time that's ever happened. You know, that happened in Jesus' day, didn't it? When they decided they didn't want to walk with him anymore and, and walked away from him. Remember that in John chapter 6? And where you got a people here that are not right with God neither. They have decided to go on and, and practice and do some things that are contrary to God. And, it, and then because they're having some issues with their livelihood, struggling, you're going to accuse God of justifying the unrighteous because it looks like they're prospering and you're not. Well, that assessment is incorrect by all means. If you, saw, you see those scriptures I got up there, Proverbs 15, 3, and Psalm 139, 1, 2. That, in that Psalm, David talks about God knowing of his getting up and laying down. And every aspect of David, like the Lord knows what's going on in his life. Uh, in Numbers 20, 32, 23, God through Moses tells the children, Israel, be sure your sins will find you out. Yes, they will. And so we need to be careful that we strive to live a holy and a righteous life. And that's based on God's word, isn't it? On God's and yeah, it's God who makes us righteous. Isn't that correct? You know, here's the problem sometimes I think with some of us, some people in the church, and, and we can be guilty of this too. And we go and go to 2 Peter chapter 3 just for a second. And we'll look at this, 2 Peter chapter 3. And just as the people during the time when Peter wrote this, they were guilty of some things here. There were those, look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? But since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But love, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, God is not slack concerning his promise. He's not slack concerning. Just because something has not happened right now doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Because in the very chapter we're studying, Malachi 3, we learn that God tells the children of Israel, Judah, in that day, I am the Lord, watch this, and I change not. The immutability of who God is in his character. And when God tells us something, that something's going to happen, it is going to happen. And here, now men, it is men who count slackness. That's right. You see, it's a, it's a lack of trust and faith. We, we really don't take God as word. And those of us in the church, we can be guilty of this. You know, we can live in such a manner. We know that we're not living like we ought. And, and deep down inside, we're hoping the Lord ain't coming today. That's right. Now, I can't speak for everybody, but I know there's some probably. We should be living as though the Lord is coming today, shouldn't we? He'd be coming in any We don't know when the Lord is coming, do we? You know, is that the warning that Peter gives here in verse 10? Watch what he says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. You see, look at the warning that we who are Christians are receiving here. The similar kind of to what Malachi was telling the people of that day. Who's saying, where is the God of justice? Where is he? 
He ain't going nowhere. God is still there. Now, I'm going to get to something that they failed to realize as to why God has not just administered his wrath or justice. That's a judicial term. But he certainly can. Aren't you thankful that maybe the Lord ain't come back yet? Maybe some in the Lord's house ought to be thankful. You know there's something amiss in your life and you need to get it right. Well, let me tell you something. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Uh, you can't do nothing about yesterday. That's gone. All you have is now. You don't even have tomorrow. You know, you, I don't, you don't want to be walking through your Christian walk knowing that there's something not right where you need to take care of it, hoping that you're going to see tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to see tomorrow or not. There's a lot of people who thought they was going to see tomorrow, and they didn't see tomorrow, did they? Well, look, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. No, it's unexpected. There's a thief. You know, thief doesn't make an announcement. I'm coming to your house to rob you. That's right. He comes when you least expect it. He says, in thee which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. Now, here is the key. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness. What, what manner, what type of life should I be living? That's right. A holy life. One that's been sanctified and set apart for the master's use. Isn't that correct? We can't live like the world. We used to live like the world, but we can't live like the world right now. Being that Peter puts this before the readers of the day, what God's going to do, God one day is going to settle all accounts. God is going to vindicate his justice one day. He's going to come back and destroy the world. Now, knowing all this, brethren, what manner of life ought you to be living? Knowing that. And we just learned that God does not lie. We learned that with God, his promises come true. Whether it comes true in our lifetime or sometime later, it's coming. But one thing is for sure, you need to be sure that you're right with God. Whether you be here when he comes or when you leave here. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person are you to be? Watch this, in all holy conversation and godly, looking for and hastening unto the coming of that day. We should be living so that we're looking for it. We're preparing for it. And so here, God is not marked in this matter. We don't want to take God's long suffering for a mere granted. We don't want to take that for granted. You know what? We need to be thankful God is long suffering. Hmm? Hmm. It's a sermon in itself, isn't it? God's long suffering. What an attribute to his character. God is bearing with us as we strive to make it to the promised land. You see, you can fool some of the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all of the time. You know who said that? Abraham Lincoln, many years ago. And you know what? You can't fool God none of the time. Yeah. You might get away with some of the people around here, but you can't fool the Lord. The Lord knows what's going on in your life. Well, see, God is not marking. So what does the Malachi go on further to say? That he will be like a refiner. See that? You go back to uh, Malachi chapter 3 and look at verse... Uh, Three, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering and righteousness. Now, now God is replying back to the people through his messenger, who Malachi. Now, who's going to be this great refiner? Who do you think that refiner is going to be? It's going to be Christ. Christ is going to be the refiner. Christ is the world's spiritual reformer. You see, think about this. 
The world has never been the same since the Lord came on the scene. You think about that now. Think about that. The world has never been the same since the Lord came on the scene. You see, Christ revolutionized men's thoughts, their emotions, their aims, their habits. Christ appealed to something that changed man. And what did, what did he appeal to? What do you think the Lord was appealing to? Not that he wasn't appealing to men back in the Old Testament, but when the Lord came personally, he appealed to something. Remember, there were some men that came to apprehend the Lord. Remember that instance? The Sanhedrin had sent them, and when they went to apprehend him, they heard the Lord speak, and they came back what? Empty-handed. Man, what happened? What did they tell the Sanhedrin? Asked them, well, why did you bring him back to us? And you know what their reply was? Never have a man ever speak like this. Ah, as the refiner, as the fire himself. You see, there's fire in God's word. Remember the two that went, that, that saw the resurrected Christ, and they were on their way back to, uh, I forgot the name of it, did it. And the Lord speaking to them said, he called them slow to believe. That's right, not have enough faith. And then after he had spoke with them, they spoke to themselves and said, did not his word burn within our hearts? Yes. You see, Jesus appealed to men's hearts and their character. See, God is going to manifest his justice. And what takes place in the refining process? So he says, as silver, what takes place in this? If anybody know anything about smelting, when you take the raw ore and you heat it up, the process and get it into the most intense of the fire, there's something you're trying to get rid of. What do you think that might be? Now, I'm not no expert on that, but you know, I've read a little bit on it. Impurities, there you go. I'm trying to get rid of what? The dross. That's the whole idea. And so the smelting process extracts the metal from the ore using extreme heating and melting. That's what takes place. Silver smelting takes unrefined silver through the process to get all the impurities out to bring it to its purity and beauty. So what is the Lord doing? The Lord will allow you to go in the fire, in your trial, in the midst of the heat. You know, a lot of us complain when we're in that trial. But look, I got news for you. That trial, that's good for you. No, thought you hear me say that, did you? Yeah, it is. It do you good to go through some trial. Oh, yeah. You need to go through the trial. Why? Because God then, in the trial, is trying to get your deficiencies out of you, your imperfections out of you. That's what the Lord is working. The Lord works on you till after a while, after you've been in that heat long enough, as he's in the refiner's seat, the God will pull you out of it then, so he can see his own image in you. Thank God. Man. There you go. That's why. Stop fighting that trial. You're in that trial for a reason. That's correct. You're in that trial to get your deficiencies out. When you're in that trial, you become more dependent on God because you're looking for God. You need help. Help me, oh God. Whereas at first you might not have been calling on him as you should have been. Oh, yeah. It's good to go through the trial. And all of us have been through some type of trial. It might not have been as extreme as the Hebrew lads during Daniel's day that were about to be cast in that furnace. We go through, each and every one go through our own little trials, don't we? Of course we do. Yeah, so when all the dross is out, the refiner is able to see his reflection. The Lord wants to see his reflection in you. Isn't that the purpose of what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 8? Remember that, Romans chapter 8? What does Paul say there in Romans 8? Let me read that right quick. He says right here, and we know all things work together, verse 28, for good to them that love God. Did you hear that? All things work for good to them. Who does it work good for? 
There you go. Thank you, Brother Darwin. Those that love God who are called according to what? His purpose. Now, here's verse 29. This, this, this is where you're trying to get to. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed. Predestinated. In other words, God didn't predestinate you to be saved just because who you are. No, he predestinated you in his son. That's right. When you obey the gospel, now you become a part of that predestination. So see, that depends on you. It depends on you to obey the gospel, to be in his son. That's when you predestinated. Now, so what was God's foreknowledge and what was his intention for all of humanity and creation? After the fall behind Adam, here comes the second Adam, and now we have the ideal man. This is what God had in mind for that second order. When you read that verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if any man be in Christ, he becomes a part of a, not just creature, but a new creation. That's a new order. Did you know that? Old things are passed away. Why? Because there's going to be a reform in the heart and the mind. That's come from Jesus. Think about that. Old things are passed away, but whole all things become new. So as the refiner here, the Bible says in verse 29, to be conformed to the, watch this, the image of his son. That's God's intent and purpose for you. He wants you to conform to the image of his son. Was God pleased in his son? Now, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Watch this. Here Ye him, where did you hear that at? Where did you read that at? There you go, Emmett. Matthew 17, verse 5, on that transfiguration. God was pleased the Father in his son. What, what, what did God have in his mind? That you are in the image, you become the image, be conformed to the image of his son. That's what God wants, so that he might be the firstborn among many of the brethren. Ah, firstborn under righteousness, our Lord. Firstborn meaning not to die again. One day you're going to be resurrected not to die again. And he's the firstborn of many who will follow his path back to heaven. That's what, that's what you're hoping for, isn't it? Yeah, that's what we're hoping for. So when we think about the, this process of refining, just think about those he met while Jesus was here on this earth. Think about Nicodemus. Huh? Part of the Sanhedrin, part of the Pharisees. But Jesus saw something in, in Jesus, didn't he? Huh? He came to him by night. A lot of people say he was afraid. Maybe because what the others would think was saying. You know, sometimes it takes a lot of courage for the Lord to come through, right? So Nicodemus came tonight and said, we know that there are a man that, I, that come from God. We know this because no man can do what? The miracles and the signs, things that he did. Nicodemus recognized that. So, so how did God, how did Jesus refine Nicodemus? He cleared up his ignorance. He expounded to him, explained some things about Nic to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he can't what? See the kingdom of God. Up in verse 3. Now, now, how do we know Nicodemus was ignorant of this matter? Because of what he said in verse 4. Well, how can a man be born again? You know, Nicodemus ain't the only one that's ignorant in this. There's a lot of people in the world that still don't understand this whole thing. We get to verse 5, and, and Jesus goes on to say, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man, not a baby, Except the man be born of the water and of the spirit. Did you know all Greek theologians and Greek uh, scholars said at one time, they all understood what that meant, baptism. You know, I was watching the movie not too long ago, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you ever seen that? That's the one from 1977. And they had Nicodemus come to Jesus. And Jesus, you know, this guy, Robert Paul Powell, who was playing Jesus, Quoted everything from that context except five. I said, ain't that something? Now you leave that out. Mm -hmm. You left verse five out of there on purpose. 
because first vibe is leading to something. Jesus expound to him. I'm not talking about a physical birth, Nicodemus. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. And what does that spiritual birth involve? Being born of the water and of the spirit. That's what it involved. He was talking about being baptized. That's what the Lord is talking about. That's the spirit. That's part of the spiritual birth. You know, the process of hearing, repenting of your sins, and confessing his name. And then the baptism is the consummation of the birth. It completes it. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 28, go ye in all, what? He says, go ye in all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. How about Zacchaeus? Remember Zacchaeus? Luke 19, 1 through 10. Remember Zacchaeus had exacted more than he should have. And, and after Jesus came to him, he he had a change of heart, didn't he? And he said, if I have taken anything wrong, I'll, I'll give back even more, four times as much. You see, the, there's the refining. You see what the fire is doing? It's getting the dross out, the imperfections in his life. How about the Samaritan woman? Remember her at the well? What'd she find out about herself? See, the Lord says, why don't you go to your husband? She said, I have no husband. He said, that's right. You have had five husbands and the one that you're with now, that's not your husband. And then she went back into town and told him all that this man had ever told me about myself. Yeah, he's refining. Get the dross out. What about the sinner who came to, uh, uh, the simple woman who came to, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, the, the Pharisee. Jesus went to his house to have, to eat, to have a feast. Now, it's not Nicodemus. Anybody know that off the top of the head? It's in, I can tell you where it's at right now. It's in Luke 7, verse 37. When, when he was there eating, this sinful woman came in. Now, they wanted to cast her out. They, they was, Master, you know what type of woman this is? She's a sinner. I almost had the name. Did anybody look that up right quick? Simon's house. There you go. Who's at Simon's house? And Jesus said, no, no. And what did she do? She took her tears and washed his feet and her hair. She anointed him with some ointment. And he, and he looked at Simon and said, when I came to your house, of course, that was customary back then. You didn't do these things. He said, but this woman, from the time I said, she came and she did this. And he looked at her and said, daughter. He said, your faith has saved you. Now, now listen to the blessing she's about to do. Your faith has saved you. Now, go and sin no more. See, here is the refiner sitting in the seat. He's appealing to the hearts of men and women. How about those 11 apostles? Now, here they spent... Three years with the Lord. And then on the night of his trial, what did they do? They, they fled, didn't they? Now, Peter followed the fall, but they fled. They were afraid. But then after that resurrection, when he met with them again, he upbraided them in their unbelief. And then they weren't fearful anymore, were they? Because by the time you get to chapter 5 of Acts, you see the apostles Standing before the Sanhedrin, preaching in the street, proclaiming the Lord and, and being told not to preach in his name anymore. And yet they were beaten and they, they still preached, didn't they? And they counted joy to suffer shame for his name. See, the Lord had refined them, didn't he? That's right here. Got them imperfections out, the dross out. Sometimes we need to go through the trial to get the cross out, to strengthen our faith, to be convinced, to be convicted of who God is. You see, our faith needs to be tested. When that trial, and then that, that, that trial, what James says, will work patience. Did you know in the book of Romans, Romans chapter five, I, I like this part of scripture. Romans five, verse one, we read, it says, therefore, being justified by faith, that's our faith, obedience, by the faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the faith of obedience. You see, the gospel system is a system of faith. And when we obey it, we have peace with God. Isn't that correct? Now, watch this. By whom also we have access by faith, watch this, into this grace. Yeah, have you ever, ever paid attention to the scripture? Pay attention to those words, into. Did you hear it? Not unto, but now into. Why? Because at one point, you came unto the righteousness of a God. When you obeyed the gospel, you became in the righteousness of God. In other words, in Christ. And so now, the grace has appeared to all men that bring up salvation. Titus 2.11, you hear that? Let me quote that again. For the grace of God that bring up salvation have appeared, watch this, unto all men. Ah, but you have to access it. You have to appropriate it. You know why? Because grace has instruction. Grace teaches us something. You see, when you heard the gospel, that was God's unmerited favor toward you to obey the gospel to become out of your sinful condition. Isn't that right? When you heard the gospel call, you were pricked in your heart just like those men in Acts chapter 2, and thus far you were now ready to repent. Have a change of heart. And so what does Paul say? Now, who is Paul speaking to here? He's speaking to the church in Rome. You hear it? It's the church in Rome. He says, by whom also, he uses the word we. That's a plural pronoun. That's inclusive. He's including himself. We, me, as well as you, we have access by faith into this grace, into it. Now, let's stop for a minute. Time's almost up. Who's saved by grace through faith? Y'all know where that verse is? It's in Ephesians 2.8. Well, who is saved by grace through faith? That's right. It's the Christian. Now, you know, somewhere else in the religious world will say, what? Well, I thought all men were saved by grace. Uh -uh. No. No, not all men. It appears to all men. But not until you access it, appropriate it. You see, it's like a, a glass of water on the table. I am just as thirsty. Here, where's that water at? I'm thirsty right now. See that water? If I don't appropriate this water, it won't do me no good. It, it, it's appeared to me. I got it. Now, God provided that water, but I got to access it. Or it to profit me. Ah, you got that? Oh, yeah. Make sure we understand that little principle right there. That's why so many people have not been blessed by God great as of yet. So, so who's blessed? Those, watch this. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We're in. Ah, we was outside of Christ. Now we're in Christ. See that? He says, and rejoice and hope of the glory of God. Let me ask you something. When that eunuch obeyed the gospel, did that Bible say something about him going on his way rejoicing? You better believe it. You know why? He had appropriated the grace of God. He stood in the grace of God, and now he's on his way. Now he has hope. You see, he has hope. And so God allows us to go through the trial so that we can be refined. All right. Man, I, I thought I was going to end this today. I was almost there. Uh, so, <clears throat> yes, God is still working with us. He's not done with us yet. He's still working with us while we're still on this side of eternity. We must never resent the purging of God as God purges the imperfections out of our life. God wants to make us better. Did you know that? That's the God's desire for us. God wants us to grow through our trials and not just go through the trial. See, God he doesn't want us just to go through it. He wants us to grow from it. There it is. And then truthfully, I, I think that brings about spiritual maturity because patience is involved. And as we learn 
from our trial, how to depend more and more on the Lord and not on ourselves. The Bible says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Psalm 119, verse 67. Well, we, I was going to get to the next study. We're almost there. Uh, my time is almost about up right now. But uh, anybody, somebody had their hand up earlier. I didn't, I didn't get that. Okay. All right. Well, anyhow, I appreciate your time and your attention, your comments. Uh, next week, we're going to start uh, another part of this chapter, continuing on. And uh, let us now get prepared for worship.